Hi, welcome to this Icometrics webinar. My name is Susie Bash. I'm a neuroradiologist at RadNet and I'm based in LA. Today we're going to be talking about elevating neuroimaging with IcoBrain and how Icometrics is actively transforming patient care through imaging AI. Artificial intelligence is something we hear about in discussions every day in radiology circles, and for good reason. It has tremendous impact in radiology and also in all occupational sectors worldwide. Computers can analyze large volumes of high-dimensional data and quantitate and organize that data. Computers are also better than humans at pattern recognition. Through deep learning algorithms, computers can be taught to answer questions that augment human capabilities. In my private practice setting at RadNet, I've been actively using AI tools to add value to our neuroimaging studies for the past 15 years. Since that time, I've witnessed numerous AI tools emerge on the scene, especially since the onset of these deep learning algorithms. This talk will focus on the value of the AI tool of quantitative volumetric MRI, which I use every day in my clinical practice. I will discuss how IcoBrain positively impacts and transforms patient care in a valuable and meaningful way. Icometrics utilize deep learning algorithms to develop their IcoBrain product. This is what quantitative volumetric brain segmentation looks like with the IcoBrain post-processing software. The software identifies, color codes, and labels anatomic structures. It then quantifies the volume of those structures and compares them to a large normative database to determine if the volume is statistically significant for patient age. It also provides volumetric tracking to assess for rate of change over time, which helps us to determine the rate and degree of disease progression. Quantitative volumetric imaging adds substantial diagnostic value to neuroimaging by providing objective evaluation of the imaging findings. In my opinion, it makes us better radiologists. It also makes the referring physician a better provider since it can impact clinical management. Additionally, it eliminates report bias, which is one of the greatest benefits of volumetric imaging. Estimates of volume have always been incorporated into a standard MRI brain report for interpretation. The problem is, is that we all have different degrees of sensitivity for characterizing volume. What I might consider severe cerebral atrophy, my colleague might consider moderate. Quantitative volumetric imaging eliminates reader subjectivity. It tells us exactly what degree of atrophy is statistically significant for patient age. These studies are easy to add on to any routine brain MRI at negligible cost to acquisition speed. In fact, the two required sequences are now standard protocol on most all modern magnets. It also makes financial sense. RadNet is the largest outpatient imaging provider in the U.S., and we've looked very carefully at our numbers. We do not lose money on these quantitative volumetric exams. It turns out non-capitated insurance companies are excellent at covering these exams, and the reimbursement of such more than makes up for any loss with capitated insurance. So overall, we do make a small profit on these exams. And also, it offers a tremendous referral advantage. As a neuroradiologist who reads 100% neuro, my main referrers are neurologists. Over the past 12 years of interpreting quantitative volumetric MRIs, I've noticed that once a referring physician first orders a volumetric post-processing study for a particular clinical indication, they will continue to order these exams on all of their subsequent patients with a similar clinical scenario, since they see true value in the report and the impact it has on patient management. This means that if you're the only ones offering this service in your area, you now have a loyal referrer who will continue to refer their patients to you. When ordering quantitative volumetric imaging, the referring physician simply needs to indicate which protocol is desired. IcoBrain is used in the evaluation of patients with dementia, multiple sclerosis, and traumatic brain injury. Additionally, a new epilepsy protocol report is under submission to the FDA and will hopefully be cleared for clinical use by RSNA this year. The technologist then obtains the two necessary sequences as part of the routine brain MRI, then pushes those sequences to the IcoBrain portal. If there's a prior study, that should already be in the IcoBrain database and longitudinal comparison will be provided. The desired protocol report is then generated in typically under one hour. By the time our neuroradiologist sees the study on PACS, the report is already generated and waiting for them. These are the protocol requirements for your T1 SPGR and flare sequence. Note is made that if you traditionally acquire both the axial and sagittal flare sequence on your MS patients, a 3D volumetric flare acquisition with multiplanar reformat can help eliminate that extra sequence to save time. 
It's also best to have the patient return to the same magnet using the same protocol at the time of routine follow-up, which allows for the most accurate quantitative comparison. We try to scan all of our MS patients on our 3T scanners using 3D technique, but the protocols do allow for a 1.5T acquisition and 2D technique. Icobrain does offer a CT TBI product as well, and the CT brain is actually just a routine CT brain. So let's take a look at the dementia protocol. If the referring MD is clinically concerned about an emerging neurodementia syndrome, the patient will often be referred for an MRI. It's at this point that we'd like the ICO brain study to be added on. Occasionally, the patient is also referred for an FTG brain PET CT. I've been reading brain PET CTs for about 17 years now, two at UCLA and 15 at RADNET. And I always run each pet through an additional AI tool called the MIM Neuroanalysis Post-Processing Software. This is a statistical post-processing software that will provide Z-score analysis to the SUV values in any gyrus of the brain. So you would know exactly which areas of cortical hypometabolism are statistically significant. And that, of course, increases sensitivity and specificity and reduces subjectivity. It also helps to differentiate between the different patterns of neurodementia syndromes. Now, this is an obvious case of a positive FDG brain PET CT. The image on the left is a PET MR fusion, which I fused to a flare sequence. And then the images on the right are PET CT fusion with color map overlay processed through the MIM neuroanalysis software, and you see cortical hypometabolism in the bilateral temporal lobes. Occasionally, the patient is then referred on for an amyloid PET study if there remains some kind of clinical ambiguity. I've read about 200 amyloid PET studies uh, since 2016, as uh, RADNET was one of the main sites for the IDEAS trial. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But a negative amyloid PET has this sort of appearance. The white matter looks dark, but the cortex looks light. A positive PET study shows diffuse binding of the amyloid tracer to the amyloid plaque in the cortex. So the images on the right are an avidly positive amyloid PET study. And this is a good indicator that the patient may indeed have Alzheimer's disease. Amyloid PET can detect Alzheimer's disease up to 20 years before the patient is clinically symptomatic. Icobrain can be very helpful in recognizing particular dementia distribution patterns. There are several different types of neurodementia syndromes, but let's in particular focus on Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. As one might expect, the distribution patterns of volume loss identified with Icobrain correspond to the same distribution patterns of cortical hypometabolism identified with FDG brain PET CT. For Alzheimer's, the distribution pattern is temporal, parietal, and posterior cingulate gyrus, and particularly involving the hippocampi of the temporal lobes. For frontotemporal dementia, the pattern is temporal, frontal, and anterior cingulate gyri. And then in dementia with Lewy bodies, we can see an occipital lobe predilection and also a temporal parietal and posterior cingulate gyrus involvement, but if you see occipital, you want to be thinking about DLB. This photo demonstrates an Alzheimer's cell laden with neurofibrillary tangles and surrounded by amyloid plaque, and there's also a normal healthy cell there for comparison. The hallmark of Alzheimer's disease are amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. The amyloid plaques are extracellular in location and can be directly imaged with amyloid PET. Amyloid PET is actually positive at the preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease, in fact, up to 20 years before the patient's symptomatic. There is a very large amount of amyloid deposition in Alzheimer's disease. There can be some, but not a lot of amyloid deposition in dementia with Lewy bodies. And there's essentially no amyloid deposition in frontotemporal dementia. Neurofibrillary tangles are intracellular in location and notably in the hippocampi. These can be directly imaged with tau PET, but at this point in time, tau PET's really just at the research stage. In fact, we're currently a participant in a tau PET trial at RADNET. Amyloid PET can directly image these amyloid plaques, so it's an ideal study to screen for Alzheimer's disease. The IDEAS trial launched in 2016 and was the largest brain amyloid research study to date, with 16,000 patients, over 500 imaging centers, and $100 million, led by the Alzheimer's Association and funded by Medicare and ACR. Three different FDA-approved amyloid tracers were um, administered, Amavid, Visamil, and Neuroseq. It turns out that the results of the amyloid PET studies impacted management in two-thirds of patients and changed the diagnosis in more than one-third of patients. However, unfortunately, amyloid PET is still not covered by insurance at this point in time. Let's take a look at Alzheimer's detection across a time scale. The reason we talk so much about Alzheimer's disease is it actually makes up the largest proportion of neurodementia syndromes by autopsy at 49%. So this graph shows a time scale across the pre-symptomatic 
early and late mild cognitive impairment to frank dementia. And you can see here that mild cognitive impairment is important because it represents memory loss, but with preservation of activities of daily living. So the conversion rate from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease is actually 40%. So basically everyone that develops Alzheimer's disease will pass through a phase of mild cognitive impairment, but not everyone with mild cognitive impairment will develop Alzheimer's disease. The dark green line represents cognitive function. So that would be memory impairment and generalized cognitive decline. The brown line represents activities of daily living, and the pink line is essentially icobrain. That's volumetric imaging of the hippocampi. Just above that, we have the orange line, which is FDG PET, and the light green line, which represents amyloid PET. We can see there's a very different curve from the remaining curves because it really detects Alzheimer's at that preclinical stage. There are other CSF biomarkers, such as CSF amyloid beta-42, which has a relatively high sensitivity and specificity for preclinical detection of Alzheimer's disease, but still demonstrates a lot of intralab variability at this point in time. And then there are genetic biomarkers, such as APOE. Finally, it's important to note that Alzheimer's disease doubles in frequency every five years after the age of 60, so this represents a very significant health burden. Let's look at the Icobrain Dementia Report. The pertinent anatomic landmarks for dementia quantified in this report are the frontal cortex, parietal cortex, temporal cortex, and hippocampi. The volume of these structures are listed as well as the normal range and normative percentile. They also give us the annualized volume change and the normal annualized volume change would be expected for an age-matched healthy control. Below we have the plot graphs for visual demonstration. Anything in the blue zone is less than 1%. We're also provided the flare hyperintense white matter volume. And then to the right, the volume signature gives us a bullseye graph, so we have a nice visual representation of these findings. The outer blue zone is the one percentile. The quadrilateral shape in the middle points towards any areas of statistical significance. So you see here that the hippocampi measure less than 1% for normal age. The black shape is actually the current study, and the white dotted line is the prior study. The second page of the report demonstrates a similarly constructed analysis of the whole brain volume, the lateral ventricular volume, and the percentage ratio of lateral ventricular to whole brain volume. The plot graphs below are a visual representation of these findings, and of note, this patient has statistically significant reduction in whole brain volume and statistically significant enlargement of the lateral ventricular volume. The appealing component of the IcoBrain's bullseye volumetric graph is it provides an excellent visual overview of the lobar predilection of the atrophic pattern in the different neurodementia syndromes. The graph on the left is a healthy control. The patient in the middle demonstrates a temporal parietal predilection to their pattern of cerebral atrophy with particular involvement of the hippocampi in this patient with Alzheimer's disease. The graft on the right demonstrates a frontotemporal predilection to the pattern of cerebral atrophy in this patient with FTD. So let's look at some clinical cases. This first case is an 86-year-old woman who presented in 2009 with memory loss. The MRI of the brain shows mild cerebral atrophy with a right temporal predilection. The patient then went on to have an FGG brain PET CT later that year, which shows cortical hypometabolism in the bilateral temporal lobes, which was modestly statistically significant. The images on the left are the FDG PET CT fusion with color map overlay. The image on the right is FDG PET MR, which I fused to a flare sequence. The patient's memory loss then significantly progressed and she returned in 2016. The MRI at this point in time shows moderately severe cerebral atrophy, so there's been marked interval progression. An IcoBrain study was also performed, which demonstrated statistically significant uh, hippocampal volume loss at less than 1%. The patient then went on to have an amyloid PET CT later that year, and that was grossly positive. So you see diffuse binding of that amyloid tracer to the amyloid plaque throughout the cortex. The next case is a 79-year-old woman with memory loss. She presented in 2013, and her MRI shows mild to moderate right temporal lobe volume loss. Icobrain study was also performed in 2013, which shows statistically significant hippocampal atrophy at less than 1%. But the patient's memory loss progressed, and in 2016, the patient returned. A repeat Icobrain study was performed, and again, the hippocampal volumes measure at less than 1%. And it also demonstrates the annualized volume change of the hippocampi as minus 3.57%, which gives us an idea of the rate of progression. The bullseye view at the bottom shows the current study in black and the previous study in a white dotted line. The patient then went on to have an amyloid study, 
Later that year, and there's a diffuse binding of the amyloid tracer to the amyloid plaque throughout the cortex, so the patient does indeed have Alzheimer's disease. This shows the amyloid PET study with PET CT fusion on the left, the PET image in the middle, and the PET MR fusion to an axial T2 sequence on the right. This next patient is a 73-year-old woman with memory loss. She presented in 2014, and her MRI showed mild cerebral atrophy with a biparietal predilection. There isn't a large amount of atrophy in the temporal lobes. An Eichelbrain study was also performed in 2014, and that did not demonstrate any statistically significant areas of cerebral atrophy. The patient also went on to have an FDG brain PET CT in 2014, and this demonstrated mild hypometabolism in the bilateral temporal lobes, although the values were not statistically significant. The images on the left are an FDG PET CT, and the images on the right are FDG PET MR fusion. The PET, however, did demonstrate statistically significant cortical hypometabolism in the bilateral posterior cingulate gyri and bilateral parietal lobes. This same patient then returned in 2016. And although there isn't a large degree in the amount of temporal lobe atrophy, there was significant progression in parietal lobe atrophy, which was now moderate in degree. The patient then did have an amyloid PET-CT study also performed in 2016, and that's diffusely positive. So the images here in the upper right are the amyloid PET-CT fusion with color map overlay run through the MIM neuroanalysis software. The images in the lower left-hand corner are PET-MR fusion, which I fused to a T2-weighted sequence here on the right. And on the left side, I fused to a flare sequence. The patient then did come back for one additional follow-up MRI study in 2018, and now we're starting to see atrophy in the bilateral temporal lobes. So this is just a reminder that quantitative volumetric imaging is really a volumetric snapshot at one particular point in time, and atrophy will progress over time. But if you catch it early, that uh, quantitative imaging study may not be positive which highlights the importance of doing repetitive volumetric imaging each time the patient comes back for the follow-up MRI. This next patient is a 76-year-old man with memory loss. The initial MRI in 2015 demonstrated moderate left temporal lobe atrophy. An eicobrain study was also performed in 2015, which demonstrated statistically significant hippocampal volume loss at less than 1%. The patient then went on to have an amyloid PET study in 2016, which was diffusely positive. The images on the left are the PET-CT fusion, and the images on the right are the amyloid PET-MR fusion, which I fused to a T2-weighted sequence. You can see diffuse binding of the amyloid tracer to the amyloid plaque in the cortex. This next patient is a 72-year-old woman with memory loss. An MRI of the brain in 2016 demonstrated at least moderate atrophy in the right temporal lobe and mild to moderate atrophy in the left temporal lobe. An eicobrain study was also performed in 2016, which demonstrated statistically significant atrophy in the temporal and parietal lobes and specifically within the hippocampi as well, between 1 and 2% in each of these regions. The patient then went on for an amyloid PET-CT later in 2016, and this was a positive study. You see diffuse by of the amavid tracer to the amyloid plaque throughout the cortex. The image on the left is a PET-CT fusion image, and the image on the right is PET-MR fusion with a T2-weighted sequence. This next case is a very interesting case. This is a 72-year-old woman who presented in 2012 with memory loss and some balance difficulties. I read this study out as actually NPH because there's ventricular megaly that's out of proportion in size to the high midline sulci. I like to use the high midline sulci when assessing for NPH because the lateral sulci can still enlarge in the setting of atrophy, and this patient does indeed have cerebral atrophy as well. The patient was then lost to follow-up and came back three years later with progressive memory loss, progressive gait difficulties, and had now developed some urinary incontinence. The MRI in 2015 demonstrates progressive sulcal narrowing, particularly along the midline, but even laterally as well. The ventricles are now larger in size. So this is a definite case of NPH because the sulci are going in the opposite direction than we'd expect. The patient was then shunted later in 2015. So the repeat MRI in 2016 shows some improvement in the degree of ventricular megaly. I notice in most shunted NPH cases, the ventricles don't really ever go back to normal size, but um, you do see improvement in ventricular size but the patient, again, also does have superimposed cerebral atrophy. One of the interesting elements of this case is that this patient did have quantitative volumetric imaging in both 2012 and in 2016. 
Again, the 2012 was the pre-shunt study and 2016 was post-shunt. So my question to the audience is, what do you think NPH looks like on quantitative volumetric MRI? In this case, both the 2012 and 2016 IcoBrain reports describe statistically significant hippocampal atrophy at less than 1% for patient age and statistically significant enlargement of the lateral ventricles at 100%. However, in 2016, the whole brain volume had actually decreased by 72 milliliters with respect to 2012. So we know there's been progressive atrophy superimposed on the NPH on the follow-up MRI. When we have progressive atrophy, we would expect progressive compensatory dilatation of the lateral ventricles, but that didn't occur in this case. In this case, we actually lost 18 milliliters of volume in the lateral ventricles since the patient had been shunted by 2016. So I just want to emphasize a word of caution with respect to quantitative volumetric reports in an NPH case. NPH causes ventricular dilatation unrelated to the compensatory dilatation, which you see in cerebral atrophy. Additionally, inferior lateral ventricular dilatation can put pressure on the hippocampi, artificially lowering the hippocampal volume. Therefore, an NPH patient could theoretically demonstrate a false positive appearance for dementia on quantitative imaging, since the report could show statistically significant hippocampal volume loss due to hippocampal pressure and statistically significant lateral ventricular enlargement, both of which could be unrelated to true atrophy. So this illustrates why it's important to always pay close attention to the whole brain volume and quantitative imaging at follow-up, as this will tell you whether there's true superimposed progressive atrophy, as we see in this case. On the other hand, there's also a real advantage of doing quantitative volumetric MRI in MPH patients, because it gives you an objective, quantifiable measurement of ventricular volume over time. Sometimes manually measuring the bifrontal ventricular diameter and the transverse diameter of the third ventricle is not always the most precise and accurate way to assess for progressive ventricular megaly due to variations in slice sampling and head angulation between subsequent exams. But on quantitative post-processing, it gives us a true accurate volumetric measurement, so it's a much more reliable and time-efficient longitudinal surveillance tool. The same NPH patient also came for an FDG brain PET CT in 2015, and this demonstrates cortical hypometabolism in the bilateral temporal lobes, which was statistically significant only on the left side. The images on the left are the FDG brain PET CT. The images on the right are FDG PET MR fusion, which I fused to an axial T2-weighted sequence. And finally, this patient came back for an amyloid PET CT study in 2016. The images on the left are the PET CT fusion with color mapping, and the images on the right are PET MR fusion, which I fused to an axial T2-weighted sequence. You can see the shunt in place here and the diffuse binding of the amavid tracer to the amyloid plaque in the cortex. Now let's look at the advantages of quantitative volumetric imaging in patients with multiple sclerosis. Patients with MS often present with ill-defined neurologic symptoms such as fatigue, cognitive change, and coordination difficulties. If the neurologist is clinically concerned, an MRI is typically ordered, as this is a diagnosis that's often easily made on MRI. It's at this point that we encourage the neurologist to tack on the IcoBrain volumetric study. If there remains some clinical ambiguity, sometimes the CSF is analyzed for oligoclonal bands. IcoBrain is very useful in quantitatively assessing the volume of flare hyperintense plaques and also assessing for interval change of plaque burden and atrophy over time, which can impact MS drug modulation therapy. IcoBrain segments the cortex and the plaques and color codes the plaques according to location. Regional segmentation is labeled as purple, juxtacortical, yellow, periventricular, green, infratentorial, and blue, deep white matter. Dynamic segmentation is also performed with new plaques marked as red, enlarging plaques as orange, and pre-existing stable plaques as green. This is the IcoBrain MS report. The IcoBrain MS report gives us the volume of flare hyperintense plaques, the volume change over time, and also the volume of new, enlarging, and shrinking plaques does the same thing with T1 hypointense plaques, which is an indicator of chronicity. And then below we have bar graphs of both the current and the prior study, and that also is separated according to region of the brain. The second page of the report gives us whole brain and gray matter volume with the plot graphs below. The IcoBrain MS reports can also be set up to have a pre-populated reporting template 
which is essentially like a natural language report. And this can be integrated into your power scribe or a dictation system that you use. And it's at the radiologist's discretion whether they want to copy and paste this into their uh, impression of their findings or into the body of their report or whether they'd like to leave it out. But it's also a good communication tool to the uh, referring physician and even to the patient. So it provides an impression of what the diagnosis is. It tells you the total volume change in milliliters, the enlarging volume, and also it actually gives you a count of the new lesions as well as the volume of the new lesions. And then it provides information about whole brain volume and gray matter volume. One question I often get asked is does adding quantitative volumetric post-processing to your routine brain MRI save the neuroradiologist time or cost them time? Well, that really depends on the simplicity of the report, the accuracy of the segmentation, and the value of the information provided. IcoBrain does a good job fulfilling all three criteria, so the answer is yes, it certainly can. This issue was actually addressed in a small clinical trial where a neuroradiologist was asked to dictate 100 MRI scans with MS presented in random order from 11 imaging centers in a timed fashion. Half of the MRIs had IcoBrain and the other half did not. The results showed a 60% increased productivity when IcoBrain was added compared to without. Specifically, the neuroradiologist could dictate an average of 13 reports an hour with IcoBrain and 8 reports an hour without. And now let's take a look at the brand new epilepsy report. This is the new IcoBrain epilepsy report, which is still FDA pending, but hopefully will be cleared for clinical use in the next few weeks. This shows the hippocampal volume with respect to the whole brain volume percentage. It's actually normal in this patient. However, the asymmetry report is actually abnormal. It's minus 17.9%, which is statistically significant. So the left hippocampus is significantly smaller than the right, despite both having a normal volume. And so in this patient, you'd want to look really carefully to screen for potential left-sided mesiotemporal sclerosis. It also gives us a flare white matter hyperintensity volume, and this can be useful both for mesiotemporal sclerosis, but also for assessing for very subtle cases of focal cortical dysplasia. And finally, let's look at the utility of IcoBrain and traumatic brain injury. This is the IcoBrain TBI MRI report. The IcoBrain TBI report for MRI gives us the whole brain, cortical gray matter, and hippocampal volumes, as well as their normative percentiles with plot graphs below for visual representation. It also gives graphs of the flare white matter hyperintensities that may be pertinent in a TBI case, particularly in the setting of diffuse axonal injury. So it looks at subcortical, cerebellum, corpus callosum, and brainstem. Now let's look at IcoBrain TBI CT reports. So the report on the left is a currently used TBI report, but the report on the right is actually FDA pending and hopefully will be approved in the next couple of weeks. And so let's focus on the report on the right because that has some very useful upgrades. It tells us what the largest amount of hyperdense blood is in the epidural, subdural, and parenchymal space, and then the total amount of hyperdense blood in each of those spaces. It also measures the CSF in the different cisterns. So that would be normal CSF surrounding hyperdense blood if present in the supracellar, prepontine, and ambient, and quadrigeminal plate cisterns respectively. It also gives us a measurement of ventricular size and also the asymmetry index for the ventricles. So you see in this patient, there's right to left midline shift, which is compressing the right lateral ventricle and causing some entrapment at the level of the frame in a Monroe. So there's mild hydrocephalus of the left lateral ventricle. And so there is statistically significant asymmetry in the ventricular size here. And then the report also measures the midline shift for us. And then we have the bullseye graft, which tells us which areas are statistically significant, so in this case, there's statistically significant reduction in the amount of normal CSF in the supracellar cistern because it's filled with hyperdense blood at less than 1%, and that area is shown in blue in the bullseye graph. So this next case is a very interesting case. This is a 61-year-old professional football player who was demonstrating signs of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I interpreted an MRI of the brain on him in 2019, and it showed a completely normal brain volume. I was not able to detect any kind of hippocampal volume loss or cerebral volume loss in any way. However, incidentally, I noticed that he had multiple sclerosis, which was previously undiagnosed. 
An ICO brain study was also ordered at this time. The patient had significantly impaired word recall and learning difficulties on neuropsych testing and was having progressive memory difficulties. The ICO brain results I found very surprising in this case because the hippocampal volumes actually measured at 4.3% of the normative percentile for patient age, which is lower than what I would have expected because his brain volume is actually very high. So his whole brain volume is actually at 82%. His temporal lobe cortical volume is at 92%. So this is a gentleman who has an overall very full brain volume. The patient also had an FDG brain PET CT at the same time, and the FDG PET was completely negative. So there was no evidence of cortical hypometabolism in the temporal lobes. The image on the left is the PET-CT fusion. The image in the middle is the PET. And the image on the right is a PET-MR fusion, which I fused to the T2-weighted sequence. The patient then returned for an amyloid PET study. And to my surprise, the amyloid study was positive. You see diffuse binding of the amavid tracer to the amyloid plaque throughout the cortex. The image on the left is the PET-CT fusion with color map. And the image on the right is the PET-MR fusion, which I fused to a T2-weighted sequence. So the question is, does this patient actually have Alzheimer's, possibly superimposed on chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or is this all chronic traumatic encephalopathy? So in the clinical setting of CTE, trauma has been suggested to demonstrate increased amyloid beta peptide levels, although the extent of amyloid deposition in CTE has not been thoroughly characterized. So this certainly could be a CTE case, particularly because the FDG PET was completely negative and the patient's whole brain volume was actually in the 82 percentile. So in summary, AI tools such as volumetric post-processing with IcoBrain positively impacts the diagnostic utility of neuroimaging. It elevates our capabilities as neuroradiologists to improve management and help transform patient care by providing enhanced meaning and objective value to our imaging interpretations. Thank you for joining us.